Today, the aircraft factory does more than provide some of the weapons of war. It has become the nation's most vital source of military power. A small group of components may be all that it produces, but if output should fall, our national strength would be threatened. At this critical stage in the war, an aircraft factory is priceless. In peacetime, each lathe, each drill, cost thousands of pounds. In time of war, they may be irreplaceable, except after vital weeks of lost production. Yet the most precious contents of this factory are not made of metal. It is upon the men and women who stand behind the controls that victory or defeat ultimately depend. These men and women work long speed up hours. They take over from the night shift at half past eight in the morning and work on until half past eight in the evening, at least 60 hours a week at the machines. Besides long hours, the war has brought other threats to factory welfare. Blackout must be perfect, but the day shift can't afford to lose the benefit of daylight and ventilation. Electrically controlled shutters are one of the welfare measures which can help the workers to stand the strain of speed up month after month. Factory medical faces industry today, new sources of adult labor must be found. The women entering industry must be proved fit for the job. They must be trained patiently. Their pace of work must not be forced, however great the need. Too fast a pace means strain, and strain means inefficiency and frayed nerves. The needs of war are not served by neglecting safety devices. The hands of the worker have never been more valuable than they are today. The lives of the workers have never been more precious. Overshadowing the danger of industrial accidents are the new dangers of total war. Upon the air raid defense system may depend the lives of thousands. Its smooth working must be perfected by regular rehearsal. The workers are ready to defend themselves with their own guns. They are ready for gas. They are ready for casualties. They are ready for their factory to become a battlefield where the central control officer will maneuver his defending forces like a general. During the morning ARP rehearsal, there will be empty places at the benches. But soon, the gunner will be back at his capstan lathe, the stretcher bearer at his inspection bench, and the control officer will be works engineer once more. The best factory discipline is the self-discipline of the worker. He knows better than the clock and better than the foreman just when a quick break for refreshment is not time wasted. In this factory, there are always hot milk drinks available at the benches. Trolleys circulate through the workshops all day. The men may buy cigarettes and smoke them when they please. It's their speed up, and they know that output is not increased by a prison-like discipline. In wartime, the canteen manager is a key man. He knows that the industrial army marches on its stomach. The food which passes across the canteen counter is as important to the output of the factory as the steel and aluminium which goes through the workshops. The war has finally proved the advantages of communal feeding. The workers here can buy a complete meal of two hot dishes for eightpence. Here are the men and women who work the lathes, the grills, the milling machines and the furnaces. Here are the assemblers, the testers, the inspectors and the storemen. Here are the clerks, the typists, the accountants and the bookkeepers. The human machine is being recharged 
And for an hour, the factory is silent. 60 hours work a week leave little time or energy for exercise. But lunch hour football is a British factory tradition, and it would take more than a war to stop it. The older men prefer quieter pleasures. After long hours standing at the machines, they get tired. The midday break means rest and relaxation as well as a meal. The energy of the factory is being regenerated, ready for the longest spread of the day's work, which is still to come. Men working 60 hours a week may get jumpy. Perhaps their work begins to take too much out of them. Perhaps it gets monotonous and boring. Experts in industrial fatigue have found a way in which the BBC can cooperate to ease strained nerves and relieve monotony. five in the evening, there's half an hour's break. The recreation hall is busy now, and it'll remain so for the rest of the evening. Some of the workers are waiting for the night shift. Others may have the day off and a chance to see something of the children. They're working on a rotor system which gives them one free day in six. Today's shift works on into the evening. Outside in the dusk, are workers who are prepared to use what little leisure they have to organize their own defense. The factory has its own anti-aircraft gun to repel attack by air. It has its own armored cars to play their part in repelling attack by land. At half past eight in the evening, the shifts change. The men of the day shift report progress on the job. They explain the set of the machines. The night shift settles down. When they leave the machines, it'll be daylight again, and beside them will be a small mountain of the parts they are making week after week, each part precisely identical with the next. For a third time during the 24 hours, the workshops are silent. Half an hour after midnight, the night shift relaxes. The night concert provided by the workers themselves symbolizes the new spirit which is growing in the factories. In face of the common danger and under the common strain of a great industrial effort, the workers of this factory have been welded into a community. A community providing its own organization, its own recreation, its own protection.